from Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In 2011, Pennsylvania judges Mark Chivarella and Michael Conahan were sentenced to federal prison for their roles in a scheme that came to be known as Kids for Cash. Chivarella and Conahan had used their positions in county court to help construct a new juvenile detention center. At the same time, the judges made sure the facility would have a steady stream of business, including children only guilty of committing minor offenses. The two judges earned large fees for their involvement in the project, as well as another facility that opened soon after. But their fortunes would soon take a turn. Chivarella and Conahan stood accused of personally profiting by sending children to jail, and prosecutors soon charged the judges with a wide range of federal crimes. In the end, Conahan was given a sentence of 17 and a half years. Chivarella was sentenced to 28 years. But while their punishment came as a relief to many of their former victims, some argued it wasn't enough that the scandal revealed a need for larger reforms in juvenile justice, both in Pennsylvania and across the country. My guest today is Bill Eckenbarger, a journalist and author of the book Kids for Cash, which offers a definitive account of the judge's kickback scheme. Eckenbarger has reported extensively on Pennsylvania politics, and in 1980, he was part of a team of reporters that won a Pulitzer Prize after covering the accident at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant we're going to be discussing an often overlooked segment of America's population of jailed inmates, the children being held in juvenile detention. We'll also look at the reforms currently underway in Pennsylvania, which are reshaping the state's juvenile justice system and could offer a model for the rest of the country. Our conversation is next. Bill Eckenbarger, welcome to American Scandal. My pleasure, Lindsay. So let's start our conversation with getting a scope of the issue at hand. Um, maybe some numbers would help. Right now, how many children are incarcerated in juvenile detention centers throughout the United States? Well, Lindsay, according to the federal authorities, there are about 25,000 kids incarcerated in the United States today. Now, there will be about the same number tomorrow, but they won't be the same kids and different the next day and next day, so that um, over a period of a year, you have a lot more kids incarcerated than 25,000. Now, has that number in recent years gone up or down? It's gone down. It was up around uh, 100,000 about 25 years ago, but that's going down for a number of reasons. Mainly, uh, many states have seen that uh, it's very expensive. Well, let's continue to peel back these numbers a bit. These tens, if not hundreds of thousands of children what kind of crimes are they accused of? Well, you know, Lindsay, the, the news out of juvenile court is very bad. Uh, violent kids, young predators. We just had the uh, case of the six-year-old boy shooting the school teacher. But the, but the fact is that only about 5% of juvenile arrests are made for murder, rape, or other violent crimes. Most of these kids in detention are there for substance abuse, property crimes, and so-called status offenses which are offenses that would not be a crime if they were adults, like truancy or running away from home. So we have a large population of children incarcerated for relatively minor offenses. What is the stated goal of this order of operations? The stated goal of incarceration is rehabilitation, but studies have shown that there's very little of that actually going on. And this is a real problem because... Most of these kids come from low-income families, have learning disabilities and mental health issues, and are more likely to have poor support from home. But they need help more than most kids, and they're getting less help. Let, let's put a face to some of these observations about the juvenile justice system. You've reported firsthand on the Kids for Cash scandal. Could you share some of the stories you heard about kids who were jailed and what happened when they grew up? Probably the the worst single story is um, it was a boy who um, his parents bought him a uh, surprise gift of a motorbike for his 15th birthday. 
uh, unbeknownst to the parents or the boy, the motorbike was stolen. John Chivarella had the boy placed in PA childcare for six weeks. The boy never recovered. As an adolescent, he was in and out of trouble with the law. And last year, he died of a drug overdose at the age of 28. And that's, that's probably the worst example that I know of. But the fact is that some of these kids have rebounded and begun productive lives. But many others are suffering prolonged emotional stress, nightmares, long-term psychological damage, disrupted educations and careers, instinctive fear of police and other authority figures, and a deep, deep disdain for the justice system that failed them. Now, you're describing a situation, you know, anecdotally, but can be writ large, of a system that's failing children. That's clearly an emotional cost that we can feel. But earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that the number of children behind bars has been dropping because of a different cost, that incarcerating children is very expensive. Explain. Well, the, uh, nationally, the, the average cost of juvenile detention of a single kid is around $300 a day. Several years ago, a think tank estimated that nationally, we were spending nearly $6 billion to imprison children, most of whom were not violent. All of this is paid for by state and local taxpayers. So we're, we're developing a picture in which the American system of juvenile justice is expensive and harmful. Why are we still doing it? I think because of uh, widespread public perception we are a nation that still sees imprisonment as the best way to control crime. And why should kids be any different? In America, uh, here's a figure that you may find surprising. We have only 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of its prisoners. And many of these cases, especially these juvenile cases, their fates are determined by local or county level judges. This was the case for Mark Chivarella, and he was a popular elected civil servant. He was. He was very popular. Um, people uh, really liked him. Uh, the walls of his office uh, were lined with testimonies to his value to the Wilkes-Barre community. The height of his abuses, uh, Chivarella was named Man of the Year by the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick, an Irish-American group that uh, raises money for scholarships and, and uh, generally promotes uh, good uh, citizenship. In addition, uh, his local congressman read praise for Judge Chivarella into the congressional record, where it still stands, saying that the Wilkes-Barre area was a better place because of people like him. He was very popular among school teachers, um, around school office and teachers' lounges, he was praised to the point of eulogy when a kid got sent to the principal's office, even for something relatively minor, just call the cops, and that would get him before Judge Chivarella. So behavior that was once a matter of school discipline, shoving matches, foul language, disrespect to teachers, suddenly became far more serious. And good riddance to these kids who were often low achievers academically and dragging down the test scores. But Chivarella's popularity, I, I think, perhaps brings up the larger question. Winston Churchill quipped that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. But maybe in choosing people who will sit in judgment over the rest of their citizens democratically or even by choosing, you know, making it a popularity contest, if you will, we are not making the best choices. I think that any candidate for judge who pledged to take the high road would be doomed to defeat, uh, for sure. Uh, when uh, Everilla announced he was a candidate for judge, he stood in front of a banner reading, a remarkable choice for judge, and told a gathering of some 300 supporters that it's time for people who break the law to realize they will be punished. That's what gets votes. Promising to work towards rehabilitation does not get votes. And I, I, I have to personally admit, I have been in the voting booth and confronted with a list of, I don't know, 12, 16 judges, uh, all of the names I don't recognize. I can't really say that I did my due diligence in preparing for that choice. So I either left them blank or voted by political affiliation, which often isn't even marked in many municipal elections. So how 
if if judges are to be uh, democratically elected, how possibly could the public properly choose? Well, there there are there are many ways. There, first of all, there, there's no perfect way to select a judge. Let's, let's start with that, okay? Um, but probably popular partisan election is the very worst way. I remember that in now Pennsylvania, um, the judges not only ran uh, uh, ran for election, they ran as Democrats or Republicans. Uh, what on earth is a Democratic judge or a Republican judge? What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Um, today, there's a combination of schemes used to select judges across the country. It's it's almost endless. Almost no two states choose their judges the same way. Approximately half of the states appoint judges and half elect judges. 31 states use commission plans to aid the governor in selecting judges. Others use the, the bar associations. In Hawaii, for example, judges themselves appoint other judges. Partisan elections like Pennsylvania are held to select in 13 states and for some judges in additional eight states. So it, it, it's a hard part. There, there's no uh, uniform way of doing it. But in those cases in which judges are popularly elected, like Mark Chivarella, there is an incentive that you've already hinted to of finding the right popular message to get into the job and perhaps an obligation then to follow up those campaign promises. But once on the bench, as we saw with Chevrolet and Conahan, there are other perverse incentives. What additional pressure does electing judges or any other method of selection put on the people in these positions? How does it affect their judgment, which should be, as we hope, as impartial as possible? Yeah, I mean, the only thing a, a judicial candidate should pledge to do is follow a law. That's all they should do. And um, that's not going to get them elected. So they they have to come up with uh, romantic ideas that appeal to a largely uninformed electorate, because you can't expect the the average citizen to understand uh, the uh, nuances of the law and being a judge. It just isn't isn't something that the average voter can do. Well, I, th- um, I think that Shivarella uh, came on the scene right after um, Columbine. The shooting out in Colorado around it, that produced a great groundswell of uh, uh, support for uh, Get Tough with these kids. And uh, I, I, I think he was always kind of riding that wave. And, you know, it's, it's easy to uh, seize upon an idea that's very popular and make it your own. Uh, it's very comfortable. It's, it's a very easy thing to ride the public wave. And that's sort of what he was doing, I think. I think he honestly believes it, that he was right. And uh, write about getting tough with kids. And then he somehow managed to segue the payments um, that he received back from P.I. Chaska as a separate issue, separate from his getting tough with kids. In fact, uh, he's, he's said over and over again that he says, never accepted a dime for sending it your way. So he's, he, he's effectively divorced the, the two events from each other, even though they are, of course, directly related. So it sounds like Schifarella did have some sincere belief that punishment could have a, a rehabilitative effect. Yes, I think so. He believed that he was doing good by um, getting these kids off the street, teaching them a lesson, getting tough with them. And, and um, all, all this, of course, runs contrary to, to the uh, evidence-based information we have about juvenile justice, which is quite the opposite. But um, when you look at it in a simplistic mode, it becomes uh, uh, the, the, the same thing is applied to adults. People think that the best way to treat adults is to send them to jail. And so we've got this massive jail system with uh, all these people who are being trained to they do it all over again. So he thought it made sense, but it just is a horrible mistake. American Scandal is sponsored by BetterHelp. You've probably heard of the RTFM solution. Many everyday problems can be solved if you just read the flipping manual. But most of life doesn't come with a user manual, and it's normal to feel unsure about change and challenges, whether it's in your career, your relationships, or your role as a parent. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes them the closest thing to an instruction manual for the human mind. 
And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. And if things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. Couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash AS today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash AS. American Scandal is sponsored by Audible. My wife, daughter, and I just drove down to the Texas Gulf Coast for a long memorial weekend. We had fun in the sea, played on the sand, ate too much, and laughed just enough. But riding next to me in the passenger seat the whole way home, my wife said nothing, hardly a word except maybe that's our exit. Was she mad at me? Had I done something to deserve the silent treatment? No, not at all. She was engrossed in her newest audiobook, City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert. That's just one of the thousands of titles available on Audible. And like all Audible members, my wife gets one credit every month, good for any title and the entire premium selection, regardless of price, to keep forever. She has full access to all the bestsellers, new releases, and Audible originals. And the Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, while doing chores, exercising, or even ignoring your spouse for a five-hour drive. Get listening. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash AS or text AS to 500-500. So let's turn the conversation back to you and your career as a journalist. You have won a Pulitzer Prize for your coverage of the accident at Three Mile Island. So what switched your focus from perhaps nuclear energy policy to the Kids for Cash scandal? Well, one night in, I think, October of 2009, I got a, a phone call from my old editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I had worked for 20 years. And... Um, he told me that uh, one of the his staff people at the Harrisburg Bureau had become ill and he needed someone to cover an important hearing the next morning. Could I fill in? He told me the hearing was by a special committee created to look into the kids for cash scandal. So sure, I told him. And then I, I went to the, I, I spent most of the night uh, owning up on the controversy and uh, uh, I, the, uh, the hearing started at uh, 10 o'clock and uh, when in about an hour, I was stunned by what I was hearing, and I realized that this was this was a very very important story. In fact, it would occupy me for the next two and a half years. Um, I interviewed more than two hundred people, including forty three of the judges' child victims and their parents, juvenile justice experts, prosecutors, defense lawyers, state officials, federal agents, victims advocates, and local attorneys judges, although not the two judges, not the two bad judges. Um, I covered hearing trials and sentences, and I read thousands of pages of court documents, and uh, it, it pretty much took over my life. Uh, I, I was once told by a great newspaper editor that the most important attribute a, a journalist can have is a sense of outrage. And in my years as a reporter, I had experienced a lot of outrage, uh, particularly covering state government. But um, Nothing ever outraged me like this because these, these were kids whose lives were destroyed and, it, and it, it was terribly, terribly sad. You also live in Pennsylvania, right? Not far from where this story was centered. What is it about this area then that might have produced a scandal of this level? Well, the, 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 now we're talking about northeastern Pennsylvania. This is, uh, looks very scranton, you know, the two major cities there. Um, the, the level of corruption up there is uh, uh, almost beyond belief. Um, nepotism is everywhere. Uh, there's a fourth R in the school system, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, and relatives. Um, to get a teaching job, it's well known. It probably still isn't the case, but back during the kids' for cash time, um, to get a teaching job, is well known that when you went to, for your job interview, you, you, you put along an envelope filled with four or five thousand dollars in cash to slide over to your interviewer. This was even uh, uh, discussed at some of the colleges uh, when they were Perry teachers. It's not surprising that Wilkes-Barre was the home of Daniel Flood, one of the most corrupt congressmen in American history. Today, he is widely revered up there, 
In fact, there's an elementary school named after him. So, well, I'm getting to the point is that the stage was well set for the kids to cash candle up there. Well, I'm curious. I mean, uh, that certainly describes a culture of corruption in this particular area of the state. But how did it get so bad? Well, there's a lot of theories about that. Um, the, the, the region started out as a, as a coal mining area. And uh, initially, the, uh, the miners were greatly abused by the mine owners. They uh, unionized, and it, it became a, a struggle up there between the two sides, and jobs became very important. And uh, particularly as the coal mining jobs declined, uh, uh, government jobs became very important. And, and so you had this, this uh, attitude of patronage and giving out jobs to the right people. And that's one theory about how things became so corrupt over there. Um, organized crime had a very good foothold there. In fact, one of the judges, Judge Conahan, regularly had uh, breakfast with the leader, the local leader of the mafia, not in public. I mean, it was never, they never tried to hide it. They just got together every Monday morning or something. Whenever stories like this surface, there's often a feeling that um, certainly someone could have stopped it if they have just spoken up. There's plenty of people who are watching this happen out in the open, um, but maybe the bystander effect was too strong. What accounts do you think for the continued silence and, you know, um, the turning away that allowed this sort of corruption? Well, um, the conspiracies of silence have existed at all times and all levels of society. It's a kind of group censorship. You have to know what not to know. Uh, is kind of the, the, the way the thinking goes. Uh, as you know, for many years, the Roman Catholic hierarchy kept mum about sexual abuse of boys by priests. In the case of Kids Free Cash, uh, these hearings in which these kids were summarily sentenced and shackled and taken off to be incarcerated were witnessed by stenographers, court officers, prosecutors, public defenders, probation officers, and police. And they did nothing. Uh, what an amazing fact is that the... Um, Luzon County Bar has about 700 members who are legally obligated to report any suspicious activity by a judge. None of them, not one of the 700, ever spoke up. So um, uh, it, it's it's kind of amazing how that works, but it is this whole idea of, of group silence, group censorship. So in this instance, though, the scandal was uncovered and uh, the perpetrators were punished. And in the aftermath, the Pennsylvania legislature adopted some some reforms. What can you tell us about those laws? Well, they they, they did some good things. Uh, under the laws they passed, the right to waive counsel is greatly restricted. In 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 the case of testing, of course, uh, kids were told they didn't need a lawyer. Now it would be, be very hard for them to say they don't want a lawyer. The public defenders will be available at all times. Another important thing is that the judges have to explain their decisions and their rulings, which are called dispositions. If you're going to send away a kid for three months, you've got to explain why you're doing that. And um, one of the most horrible things that the kids told me about, the, the worst part of the experience was being shackled, but, but they said this was so humiliating, they couldn't stand it. And uh, now under under the new law, uh, shackling is greatly restricted, only in cases of extremely violent kids. So this story shows how vulnerable children are to actions of the state, and they are probably the most vulnerable population and the one we should care most about. But juvenile justice is not a hot-button political issue. Why do you think that is? Well, um, I, I think there's this, and I've said this before, this widespread misunderstanding about juvenile justice, whereby they, they equate it with uh, adult justice. It's really not the same thing, because kids psychologically are not as aware of responsibility and consequences as adults. And that gets translated to the general public. They don't get the distinction between serious offenses and normal adolescent rebellion. It essentially happens not, not just in Pennsylvania, but, uh, but throughout the nation. Um, I grew up in New York State, and, uh, and I uh, had Judge Chivarella been around when I was a kid. I probably would have thrown away because I, I did some things that, you know, no, kids do. We we did crazy things like like all of my friends, as you pointed out in the in the podcast. Uh, in 
2004, the Wolfsburg Times leader ran a series of articles that described in some detail the injustice being meted out by Chivalro's court. The only thing missing from the articles was the kickbacks, the money. Nothing ever happened as a result of these articles. Five years later, when the sordid story finally came to light, what mostly upset people was that the judges had taken millions of dollars in the scheme. The injustices perpetrated on the children were secondary or not mentioned at all. On the talk shows, the letters to the editor, the readers' comments at this time, the outrage was about the money, not what happened to the kids. From Wondery comes a new series, Flipping the Bird, Elon vs. Twitter, a story about what happens when the richest man on the planet decides to acquire a powerful social media company in the name of free speech. But does he have what it takes? It started off promising. <laughs> or is this all just about Elon? He's essentially mad that his tweets aren't performing as well as he would have expected them to. It really just felt like, okay, this really is just a platform being ruled by a dictator who does things on his own whims. And what will be left of Twitter by the time he's done? Basically, my entire team was, was gone. By the end of it, infrastructure was just completely gutted. He'll like tweet a thing and then everyone's like, we got to work on that now because he tweeted it. I'm supposed to believe this man is a genius. It just felt like everything was kind of descending into chaos. Follow Flipping the Bird wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to episodes ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. I'm going to return to outrage um, because I can hear in your voice that this was very much a personal journey for you as a journalist. And, uh, you know, I will tell you as a, as a host of a show called American Scandal, there is ample opportunity to be outraged. But this is a case that was special to you and struck you deeply. Why? Yes. I have two kids. They're, they're adults now. One girl reminded me very much of, of my daughter at the age of 15. Um, she got a dispute with her mother and she stalked out the door and um, as she was walking down the street, then she saw a cop in, in her immaturity and her anger, she gave the cop the finger, which is uh, uh, n- n- not a good idea, but is actually protected by the First Amendment. But um, so the cop wrote it before Shivarella, and uh, Shivarella sent her away for six months to a place that was uh, 300 miles from her home. Uh, her parents could visit her only only on a weekend and had to drive back and forth to do it. Uh, this kid who gave a cop the finger, was on the honor roll. She led a Bible study group. She was on the school newspaper. She had never had any trouble in school. So um, to, to me, that was a terrifically sad case of a girl who just, for one impulsive second, lost six months of her life. That really outraged me. It sounds like you're saying that uh, in this nation, there is a um, an inflated and widespread view that punishment is a legitimate response and preventative for rule breaking. Yes, there's a widespread belief, and I think far more uh, prevalent in the United States than in other um, first world countries. I, I, I think there's a much milder view, particularly on juvenile justice in, for example, Scandinavia, Belgium, the Netherlands. And I, I think they're, they're much more uh, tolerant and understanding. We've kind of danced around this a bit throughout this conversation, but maybe perhaps we can take this time to crystallize. If we have a poorly functioning juvenile justice system, what steps do you think the country can take to improve it? I think we can greatly expand the the things that that are alternatives to incarceration, uh, in school help rather than rather than kick kids out of school, keep them in school, and give them special tutoring. And help. There, there is a kind of in-home detention. There is a day detention where you go to a to a center, but in the daytime, and then come back home at night. What are the the important things? That, I mean, rather than sending the kid to jail, you can you can send them to community service, um, after school detention, loss of privileges at school, get them academic help. One important issue that that, that has not been addressed is um, private juvenile detention facilities. 
Most of these are nonprofits and important parts of the judicial system, but some of them, like PH Alker, are for profit businesses. This means that they're interested mainly in making money. That goal can only be met when they operate at full or near capacity. It counts. Not children's welfare are the bottom line here. And um, I think it would be too well to abolish all of them. Bill Eckenbarger, thank you so much for speaking with me today on American Scandal. Thank you, Lizzie. It was very interesting, and I enjoyed it very much. That was my conversation with Bill Eckenbarger, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and the author of Kids for Cash. From Wondery, this is Episode 4 of the Kids for Cash Kickback Scheme for American Scandal. In our next series, we tell the story of OxyContin, a drug that helped spur an epidemic of drug addiction in America. Sold by Purdue Pharma, OxyContin was supposed to offer a revolution in the treatment of pain. But as opioid abuse began ravaging communities, citizens, journalists, and federal prosecutors began searching for the truth. What they found out about OxyContin and Purdue Pharma would lead to a multi-billion dollar legal action. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Music by Lindsey Graham. Our senior producer is Gabe Ribbon. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer Beckman, and Marsha Louie for Wondering. Hey, listener, you asked for a little more smartless in your life, and now we are delivering. I am excited to tell you that we are making the full recorded interviews from our smartless live tour available to you exclusively on Wondery Plus. Our first guest you may know is Mugatu, Buddy the Elf, Ricky Bobby, or Ron Burgundy, amongst many other characters. But we know him as America's best friend. He's Will Ferrell, and Will discusses his new life goals, which include referring to money as cheese, and also uh, his commitment to drink at least 50 liters of water a day. Will is just the first live episode with new ones rolling out every Thursday for the next 10 weeks. We're talking with celebrities and icons like the great Conan O'Brien, Kevin Hart, Jimmy Kimmel, and so many more. You'll even get to meet Sean's sister, Tracy, from Wisconsin. These are special episodes that were recorded in front of thousands of our biggest fans. You can listen to these episodes exclusively and ad-free with Wondery Plus. Find Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts.